In your face, you sack of sh**. In your face, you sack of sh**. Hello everybody, welcome back. It's your boy with the blaze. This is Business Blaze. What am I doing? This is the channel where Danny writes us a script. I will read it and react to it. Slap the sh** of it uh, if I feel like it. If not, I don't. Um, Sam will add some memes. And that's pretty much what, what, what happens here, if you're wondering. It's a bit silly. Five more adventures that nobody needed. Often, I know this channel is called Business Blaze. People will come here being like, Ooh, gonna get me some business education. Business Blaze sounds as good as Harvard. And then they come here and they discover this. For those people, I'm sorry, you're welcome to leave. <laughs> Smash that dislike button on your way out. Anyway, for those of you who are thinking, this is exactly what I need in my life, let's continue. Well, let's begin. I should say. I've always suspected that somewhere deep in the heart of leafy suburbia, there lies a peculiar chap with a name like Gerald Onions, who loves to get involved in consumer focus groups. Customer focus groups, what is going on? Gerald I know you. is the man of tomorrow. He's got lots of cool ideas and opinions about the kinds of thrilling new- uh, Gerald, right? Not Gerald. Geralt. He's got lots of cool ideas and opinions about the kind of thrilling new product he'd love to see on the market, and he enjoys providing his considered feedback to new companies who are chasing the trends of the common consumer. But there's a problem. On a typical morning, Gerald Onions will wake up from a good night's sleep in his pause pot. If you know what a pause pot is, you original gangster business plays legend, smash that like button. Perchthemerch.co is legitimately where you could buy my merch. Someone was saying, you gotta say Perch the Merch. I was like, well, I'm gonna buy Perch the Merch with a Colombian domain.co because cocaine. God, I love cocaine. And uh, now, officially, you can go to perchthemerch.co, P-U-R-C-H, the merch.co, to purchase my merch. Perch the Merch. I make himself a little fry up for breakfast with a nice, healthy fruit drink freshly squeezed from his Juicero press. <laughs> Again, if this was, I believe, our previous inventions that nobody needed video. He might try and add a bit of seasoning to his breakfast, but the battery in his interactive salt dispenser will be out of charge again, so he'd have to go without. Another OG business blaze legend joke. He'll briefly consider snorting a line of cocaine to numb the pain of the day ahead, but which is interesting because as awesome as cocaine is, you know, to keep you awake and all of that great stuff, it is also a local anesthetic, so you know, uh, you can put it on a little area of your mouth and it'll numb the pain. So it's what I use when I've got an ulcer. I just, you know, get it in there. I snort it and then the residue that drips down the back of my throat, I try hocking that up and then pressing it onto my ulcers. Wish I could jump in there and roll around and all that cascading white powder. And then he'll self-administer an electric shock of his negative, with his negative behavior. Oh my God, Danny, there are so many references. We're moving on. Uh, Gerald will usually have time to assemble the copy of the radio newspaper, blah, 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 Sinclair C5. Oh my God, so many in-jokes. <laughs> I gotta stop or my viewer retention will end here. Let's just move on to the first product which we have today, which is the Sony mini disc. Back in the day, I Several, I was definitely of the era of Sony mini discs. There were two groups of people at the school I went to. Kids who had uh, CD players with, you know, that were jog proof so you could have it. And, well, first of all, they weren't jog proof and they'd have like, you know, 10 seconds of unskippable time, 20 seconds, and then 60 seconds. And then it was like that Sony had the jog proof CD player, uh, CD Walkman, and everyone was like, Shit, that's where it's at. Mini discs came along. Some people got mini disc players, which would, which could store more music on each disc, which was cool. Um, but I think most people had CD Walkman. And then of course there were the poor kids. They didn't have them. Back in the day, I managed to build up a pretty good collection of vinyl records. They took up far too much space in the house and many of my favorite albums ended up getting scratched so they'd either jump past the good bits or get stuck in the same groove forever. I, I believe that's probably how dubstep, dubstep music is created. It's just someone gets a old record and just makes it loop the same bit forever. Dubstep is not music. Smash that dislike button. But I still loved my records and it was a sad day when I sold the entire collection for about 20 quid just to help fund a night down in the pub. I don't know, it sounds like a pretty good use of records. Like, I'd trade an entire record collection for one good night out. Now, the super sharp sound of compact disc had arrived and it seemingly rendered my tatty old vinyl collection close to worthless. Amazingly, 
Vinyl came back into fashion years later, and now I'm buying it all back again at sky-high prices like an idiot. Everyone knows, Danny, that your investment strategy is solid. Buy high, sell low, buy high. BitConnect. Yeah, 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 okay, that's real. <laughs> This is why I'm shrewdly keeping hold of all of those hundreds of old VHS cassettes in the attic. I'm not going to get caught out twice. So I was wondering about VHS and stuff, right? Because I watch a lot of reruns of Star Trek because I'm an absolute nerd on Netflix. And Star Trek The Next Generation looks absolutely glorious in like all of its 1080p joy because it's been remastered. Star Trek Voyager has not. And I'm like, it doesn't look that bad. It really, I watched it on a big 4K TV and I'm like, this is genuinely not bad. So like, you can obviously tell the difference, but it's like, it's really not bad. It looks a whole lot better than watching it on the shit in the 90s. But a sort of similar situation cropped up a few years later with the arrival of Sony's Minidisc. Although slightly confusingly, like the Sony Minidisc was kind of launched twice with a six year gap in between. First revealed in 1992, I wasn't around for that one. I mean, I was, but I wasn't getting Minidiscs. I, I assume I was around, like I was at school in, I started secondary school, so I was 12 or 11. Uh, that's 1998, so I was definitely for the second wave of Sony mini discs. I didn't have one, I had the drug proof CD player because they're cool. The idea first revealed in 1992, the idea behind the exciting new format was to merge the digital quality of a compact disc with the portability and recordable functionality of a cassette. That is a good idea, I forgot they could record. A mini disc looked exactly like a CD, but much smaller and permanently housed inside a cartridge with a shutter which would automatically open when you shoved it inside Sony's pocket sized mini disc player. It was kind of like a floppy disc, right? Uh, but you know, better. To be honest, this was probably quite groundbreaking in 1992, long before recordable compact discs arrived on the scene. But those were also, you couldn't, I mean, most of them you couldn't rewrite. It was more of a hassle. You had to do it in your computer. I remember mini discs. I think they were a bit easier than this. For the first time, a music fan could enjoy crystal clear audio of a CD on a format which could be wiped over with new stuff without losing any quality. Oh my God, it is awesome we live in the future. Where it's like, yeah, my magical phone does all of, it doesn't, you, you know, the idea of like putting music onto the device. It's like, well, yeah, of course, but I mean, I went camping with my friends like a month ago and we're up in the mountains just like camping and I'm like I'm gonna watch some Netflix before going I'm, I'm literally outside I don't have a tent I'm just sleeping under the stars and it's like yeah I can watch some Netflix right now <laughs> and to be fair it gets even better because for some reason my network I'm with uh, Vodafone maybe or T-Mobile and my friends with O2 and I didn't have good enough reception and I was like hey Grant can you just do me a Wi-Fi hotspot and he was like yeah of course <laughs> so I was streaming Netflix on my phone off his uh off his off his phone's Wi-Fi from his tent. It was epic. Simon, why can't you just enjoy nature? I don't know, because nature's really boring sometimes. <laughs> On top of that, you could play tunes on the move, and the protective case format meant that the actual disc would be safe from the risk of any damage from fingerprints, fingerprints, scratches, and accidental spillages of coffee or pickled chutney. All right, Danny, each to their own, although I do love pickled chutney. Uh, so why didn't it take off the first time round? It was largely down to the fact that the price tag, what a surprise, didn't fit the target audience. Most serious adult music collectors with disposable incomes probably didn't feel a pressing need to splash out on this new kit that you could take outside to play your cute miniature-sized discs on. They were just happy with sticking with a proper CD for listening to and adding to their collection and cassettes and cassettes or reel to reel for recording. What's well, reel to reel? A further issue was that the record labels were playing a cautious game and waiting to see if the mini disc was going to fly before releasing titles on the new format. Could you buy mini discs with like albums already on them? I don't even remember that. I remember you could definitely take albums and put them on there. And I think this was before piracy, so you couldn't even like pirate the music and put it onto the mini disc. You had to buy the CD and then transfer it to the mini disc. But then piracy came along and solved all of our problems allegedly not that i ever did that who would do that that's terrible and unethical what so in other words the minidisc was really likely only to appeal to teenagers who wanted to create and edit their own cd quality mixtapes to enjoy when they were out drinking cheap strong cider in the woods but unless those teenagers had a paper round on a street that was particularly generous with its tips they weren't going to be able to afford the massive 500 pound price tag that the player came with in the UK, which is around $1,500 in, today, $1 in today's money, give or take a few notes. Yeah, that's a lot. I think I remember the CD players were like 100, 200 quid or something. And I remember that being, that was like, well, it, don't lose that. Only 50,000 units were sold in 1992, far below the numbers Sony had been expecting, and the idea was quietly dropped and allowed to gather 
specks of dust for six years. But then, in 1998, Sony suddenly decided to have another go with a more affordable model, model priced around $250. Following market research into the failure of the original model, they had discovered that over 75% of American consumers had never even heard of Minidisc. So, this time, it was backed up by a $30 million marketing campaign in which Sony predicted that 1998 was going to be the year of the Minidisc. Spoiler alert! They were wrong! I mean, maybe, it, maybe it was, but then it all went to sh**. But Sony up here will find out. That's why Danny writes these and I read them, you know? I learn as well. I learn with you guys. What a dream come true. But Sony appear to have left the big marketing push just a little too late. By this time, recordable CDs were very much available and affordable, while the world was on the brink of embracing new MP3 formats and the iPod. Yeah, uh, when those recordable CDs came along, I mean... It was allegedly around the same time that Napster and LimeWire and all of those technologies that I definitely had to look up because I wanted to know what privacy, uh, piracy was like in the 1990s, and of course I never did. Um, because of course you'd just download the song and then you'd burn them onto a CD using Windows Media Player, and boom! And you could fit like 20 tracks on there. It was awesome. Uh, allegedly. Allegedly. I mean, I heard it was awesome from people I watched in... on... the internet. While the world was on the brink of embracing the new MP3 format, as well as the iPod, the record labels and consumers showed even less interest in the minidisc than the first than the first time around. The format was practically dead and buried by 2002, although weirdly, Sony left it until 2013 before officially discontinuing the product. And I remember I had an MP3 player, I must have been like 16, and this was pre-iPod MP3 players, so they were like those little thumb drive things you could plug in, or mine was a little blue thing, and you'd flip open the top case and there was a little screen in there, and you could put in a uh, uh, an SD card, like a might, might have just been a regular sized SD card back in the day, don't really remember, in the side. And I also remember paying like, I saved up and saved up and I bought like a 64 megabyte SD card for like a hundred pounds. I was like, what? 170? How much would it be? Uh, 64, I guess. Maybe it was 128. Uh, but it was like megabytes. I was like, wow, I could store so many songs on this! The record labels and consumers showed even less interest in the minidisc than the first time around. The format was practically dead and buried by 2002, although weirdly, Sony left it until 2013. Jesus, really? Before officially discontinuing the product. To be fair, the original idea of a minidisc wasn't too bad and proved to be reasonably popular for a short time in Japan and parts of Europe, although it remained practically unheard of in the States. Yeah, people had these in the UK. Hey, Americans, did you... Were you familiar with minidiscs before I made this video? Uh, I'm curious. People definitely had these. They don't anymore, of course. Maybe in Japan. Uh, the main issue was that Sony had messed up the original launch in 1992 when the minidisc was at its most useful and relevant, by vastly overpricing the tech way beyond the budget of its target audience. And by the time they got around to lowering the price and putting some marketing clout behind it, Nobody really cared anymore. One unfortunate side effect of all of this is that the 1993 US action film Demolition Man had now been made to look very silly. The Sylvester Stallone movie is set in the year 2032 and depicts the widespread use of mini discs in this fictional future, so it seems quite odd when you watch it today. Having said that, maybe mini discs still have to make an unexpected comeback over the next decade or so. Stranger things have happened. It is excellent like that mini discs would become a thing, but everyone knows the most important thing about Demolition Man is that he doesn't know how to use the three seashells. The original sat-nav. This is incredibly lengthy. Imagine the scene. You're driving through the strange and bewildering streets of Sheffield in the UK in search of the nearest McDonald's. You've heard they're currently offering a limited edition four patty Big Mac. <laughs> that sounds good. And you're keen to get your hands on one before a virus comes and closes all of the branches down. If you're wondering what the Danny is talking about. That's because Danny uh, previously mentioned that Big Macs are coming with the double pound double thing, and then virus time came. Um, previously mentioned it, and we shared our sadness at this together because I would absolutely have that so hard right now. But you're not familiar with the streets of Sheffield, and you're starting to lose your bearings as you drive deeper into a thickening fog of charity shops and wheelbarrows and quizzical northern faces. Oh my god, sometimes, like, I mean, I, 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 um, I've been to the north, like, once or twice. I try not to. And sometimes, like, I remember once I went into a shop and I bought some beer, and the guy behind the counter, like, said something to me. And I just didn't understand what he was saying. And I thought he was speaking a foreign language. I was like, what? And he says it slowly and I'm like, oh, you're just talking with an extremely strong northern accent. The obvious thing to do here would be to start tapping away into the sat-nav to help you get back on the right track to McDonald's. 
just use your phone like a normal human being. But there's a problem. It's 1926. Well, the bigger problem is, Danny, that there's not going to be a McDonald's in Sheffield, is there? And secondly, I'm pretty sure there's not. I don't know when McDonald's were founded, but I get the feeling it was the 1950s, and we did a video about it, so I should know. And I also saw that movie, The Founder, with Ray Kroc. It's like 50s or 60s, I think. It feels very 50s. I forgot to mention that, but actually you might put a dampener on the whole McDonald's thing, and you might have to make do with a wimpy bar instead. Original business plays legend joke there. If you're not getting all of these, well, I'm not going to apologize. You have to just go back and watch all of the podcast videos. You'll love them. Not a guarantee, allegedly. But even though you've unfortunately been born far too early to enjoy anything half decent in life, you might at least be able to get your bearings with the Root Finder device. This was a curious contraption from the UK that could be worn like a wristwatch. Uh, I've got a picture of it here. Sam, put the picture up here. Just use this half of the screen. Bosh. To put this thing up. You inserted your choice of tiny paper scroll into the device, which would display, I'm gonna be like a weatherman, although I can't because I'll be behind the image if I point to it because it's not green screen. <laughs> if I was like, Sam, can you do that? He'd be like, Simon, it's not how it works. <laughs> I'm not gonna cut your hands for every single frame on the way down. I'd be here for weeks and I'd be like, Sam, just do it! This my crack. And uh, then he'd be like, Simon, I quit. And I'm like, you can't quit. Don't make me do what I did to Danny. You inserted your choice of tiny paper map scroll into the device which would display a very small portion of an area at a time but as long as your drive continues you manually scroll the map forward to reflect your progress and get a rough idea of where you might end up next dude just use a map like why why would you need if you're manually scrolling you could be like well how fast am i going is it tied into the car's odometer it's not uh speedometer it's 1926 so do they even have speedometers? Do they even have cars? My knowledge of history is absolutely poor. I suspect that the, I know they had cars. Smash that dislike button. I suspect that the choice of map was entirely limited to the south of England, and the rest of the UK didn't really make it onto maps until the 1960s. I don't know if that's true, but I could believe it because the south is the best. Uh, by the way, if you're if anyone's watching this not from the UK, <laughs> don't, <laughs> this is generally just me joking. I, I I have been to the north many times. I have friends who are not. No, I don't. No, I don't. I'm better for it. And it looks like Root Finder was only very briefly available as Root Finder does seem very modern as a name, doesn't it? Uh, for, like, it could be in the 1990s. Uh, it was only very briefly available as little documentation exists about the device. But it still seems like quite a sweet, if largely useless invention, which was maybe about 80 years ahead of its time. That is me pushing the image away. Sam, if you can make that happen, great. If you can't, do not worry about it because we're moving on to the Sega Activator. Although I've never taken much interest in 21st century game consoles, I did make an exception for the Nintendo Wii in about 2008. I've never really been bothered about the thought of spending hours wandering around virtual 3D environments with a gun, but I did quite fancy the idea of thrashing my arms about wildly while taking on my mates in short bursts of tennis, bowling, frisbee dog, ski jump, and milk bottle throw. What the f milk bottle throw? Can't you just do that for real? Just go out into the garden with some milk bottles and be like, uh, I disagree. I like wandering around in a like, 3D environment and shooting people, apparently. I mean, Jesus. Based on what some politicians say, he's like, wow, Simon's gonna become like a mass shooter because he loves shooting. As well as buying the console itself, I even splashed out on the silly plastic accessories for a truly authentic motion sensitive experience. If you don't have the accessories though, it doesn't work, right? <laughs> there's nothing like, there's nothing quite like triumphantly waving around a plastic tennis racket or golf club while turning to your opponent and screaming in your face you sack of shit. oh i'm sorry i need to uh that's that's in all caps in your face you sack of shit. my neighbors are gonna think that i'm some meth smoking mother or just nintendo wii and i've hurt my voice it all seems quite revolutionary at the time so it's easy to forget that sega were way ahead of the infrared motion capture game back in 1993 when they launched the activator accessory for the sega genesis or sega mega drive if you lived anywhere outside of north america I, i've heard of the sega mega drive and sega genesis never heard of it but i guess it, it that's interesting maybe this was once brought up in a video and people were like simon have you never heard of the sega genesis and i'm like oh because apparently in the uk it's the sega mega drive genesis make it sounds like uh She's got that invisible touch, yeah. That is Genesis, right? Uh, the marketing depicted tough kids freely strutting their martial arts stuff in front of the TV set and watching in awe as their killer moves got translated into winning actions on combat games such as Street Fighter II, Mortal Kombat, and Eternal Champions. The reality was a bit disappointing. The activator was essentially just a funny octagonal ring that you placed on the floor like a mat and plugged into your console. Okay, it looks like... Sam? Woo! There it is. The ring would emit infrared light beams. 
fascinating upwards and sense the reflections actually this is pretty cool and sense the reflections from your living room ceiling that's amazing some of this tech is really cool <laughs> So the idea was that a particular movement from within the octagonal ring would break the beam and trigger one of 16 different input actions for the game depending on the height and specific placing of your movement. So in other words, it was a slightly weird version of, programma of the programmable joypad that recognized your actions and assigned them to a specific game function usually performed on the standard joypad. It was even capable of determining whether you were punching or kicking as long as you were doing it over the right segment of the ring. This is pretty cool for 1993! Although it may go down in history as the world's first full mo body motion controller, it's also now considered to be one of the worst console peripherals of all time. Oh no. Well, it's one of those things that's like, that is an amazing idea, I want it for Christmas. And then you get in, it turns out to be a right piece of and you're like, oh no, I should have got the Hornby train set. It wasn't cheap at $80 a pop, and it came with its own separate power supply. If your house had vaulted or mirrored ceilings. <laughs> Who has mirrored ceilings in the house? I mean, unless you're like playing in some sort of weird sex dungeon. Uh, or ceiling fans, or slightly irregular roof beams, or just even light fittings, the infrared signals would get all cockeyed and mess up the game. Yeah, my ceiling is uh, curved here, so that's not gonna work. The ubiquitous combination moves of 90s combat games in which two buttons are pressed at once were not supported because the player couldn't physically perform two separate actions simultaneously. So this limited the mechanics of a typical 90s combat game. It was one of the reasons why it didn't receive much support from game designers and software labels. But the real knockout punch that put the Sega Activator down for the count was that it wasn't very responsive, which developed into a big problem. So it was meant to be the interface for high octane and quick reflex combat games. Yeah, you'd be playing and you'd be like, punch, punch, come on, punch. And then the guy with a, it's like racing games. Like I remember back in like, I don't know, it must've been like 1998. I had a PlayStation one or two or something like that. And I had the wheel, like the Gran Turismo wheel. And the problem was like, if you're playing it, I didn't have two wheels, obviously. And you'd be playing against your friend who's using the controller and you're using the wheel because it's your wheel. And you're like, yeah, but he will always beat you because the game is easier with the controller. So you're always like, well, I want to advance in the game and I know it's not as realistic, but I just want to play with the controller. And then when I was learning to drive, I I was like, I can drive in games. Why not? Why, why can't you just make cars with controllers? Like in. Is it Men in Black? The Sega Activator was discreetly pulled from the market just a few months after launch, but just 15 years later, this kind of motion-seeking gaming technology would start to get quite good, regardless of whether or not you had foolishly installed light fittings in your ceiling. Like an idiot. How did you not know that this was gonna be how things worked? Next up. Google Glass. I remember this one. This is a failure. I met, in fact, a friend of mine had a pair of Google Glass. I never saw him use them. I think he agreed they were a bit shit. Uh, I mean, they were the best invention ever, business daddy. I'm so sad they didn't work, and it's obviously not your fault. You're amazing. I can vividly remember the hype and buzz surrounding the arrival of Google Glass back in 2013. In fact, I even wrote a few articles about the launch of these next generation spectacles, which reflected on whether. Oh, 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 oh. But I'm up, but. Uh, on whether Google Glass was destined to become the most important invention of the 21st century so far. Spoiler alert! No. Despite all of this, I had to go back and research them because I'd completely forgotten what they were meant to do. Weren't they meant to, you put them on and then there's a little, like, so you're wearing glasses and then there's a little screen, like, that would appear here so you can see stuff that's going on, which sounds pretty cool. Like, I would like that because right now I could be presenting business plays and also, like, checking my emails. Just like this. It's a bit weird. And then I think people were like upset about the camera facing outwards and being filmed all the time. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And I, so I'm from the UK. You're being filmed all the time anywhere. I think there was a statistic that said the UK has more CCTV cameras than the entire of the rest of Europe combined. And you're like, you go to the, you're in London, you're like, yeah, I believe it. Everything is on camera. Everything. You take a shit, you're on camera and not just from up there. Allegedly. And perhaps part of the reason for the failure of Google Glass is that Google never seemed particularly sure either. Google Glass often mistakenly gets lumped in with augmented reality technology, which is understandable, as Google seemed to be suggesting themse this themselves very early during development and marketing. I suppose so augmented would be if the glasses could be like, okay, I'm looking at a, a light, and it's like, beep, 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 that's a light. Pretty sure they didn't do that. Uh, I suppose it would have been wouldn't have been too difficult to implement an option to play a VR version of Frogger while you were wearing the specs, but it probably wouldn't have been a great idea to play the game while you were rating to cross the road in real life. Agreed. But it's more accurate to say that Google Glass was meant to supplement reality rather than augment it. Yeah, so it's like, it's, it's a much simpler technology. You just have a screen up here in the side of your vision rather than the computer being able to recognize and label shit up, which is obviously a lot more complex. Uh, so these glasses were voice activated. You could check messages, get information, stuff like that. 
It's kind of like sounds like Siri, except even in 2013, this was probably better than Siri. Uh, essentially, it wasn't a million miles away from a smartphone, but a smartphone that was permanently strapped to your head. Google Glass. I've done it. I've created the greatest invention of the 21st century so far. I mean, check this out. Maybe Siri will work now because it's so close to my face. Be like, I've got my Google Glass on. Hey Siri, what's the time? You fucking serious right now? You're taped to my fucking head. Hey Siri, what's the time? Is this real? <laughs> hey Siri, what's the time? It's 10.09. What, now you work? You won't work when you're attached to my head though, will you? Well, that's why... I'm not making the best invention of the 20th century. 21st century. Uh, Google Glass wasn't originally available in shops, instead it was sold exclusively online to a small group of glass explorers, that sounds like drug users, who paid one and a half thousand dollars to become the early bird owners of this game-changing eyewear. The glass explorers tag didn't really stick, though most people who wore these glasses quickly became known as glass holes. But a bum bum uh, the most obvious problem is that Google Glass made you look like a bit of a knob. Uh, wearing a camera on your face just seemed a bit dorkish and, at the worst, creepy. Uh, the effect was made even worse when you were wandering alone on the street while barking out random instructions to your invisible friend. Although, to be fair, now, it's like, I feel that's pretty normal. Like, I'll be like, walking down the street and I'll be like, it's gonna definitely do it now if I tell it to call someone. So I'll just be like, hey, you know, Apple, name of the thing, call Mike. And it'll be like, bit -bit -bit -bit, and then it'll hopefully work. It does work better when the ear ear earbuds are in. So I guess I'm an asshole. Another problem is that the software seemed to be quite glitchy and sluggish to respond. Oh my god, did it really? <laughs> what a surprise! Uh, the battery life was only between two and three hours, during which time you would almost certainly get a headache from the jumpiness of the menu navigation. The software was also known to just randomly freeze when you're in the middle of doing something incredibly important, like using the face recognition feature to Google the person standing next to you at the bus stop. Yeah, I can see why this was creepy. The bugginess of the software led many users to believe that they had spent one and a half grand on something that wasn't even finished. It was more of a prototype that they were testing out for Google. But the biggest issue, I've, I'm pretty sure that my friend who got it, he didn't have to pay for it. He was like a tester of this for whatever reason. I think he does work for Google, but not for, I don't know. I don't understand, but he got one. I'm pretty sure it was free. But the biggest issue of all was naturally the concerns about privacy. You could quickly perform a web search on the person in front of you, or take pictures, or film them without their knowledge. Quite aside from the sinister pervy potential in this, there's also just the very simple point that a stranger in the street might not particularly want to be researched or filmed without permission. Yes. This was going to cause a problem in places like cinemas and casinos where secret filming is very much frowned upon. Yeah, dude, like you watch the beginning of the film and it's like, if you're recording this film, you'll go to prison for life. And I'm like, well, that's not true. <laughs> How many here is like, yeah, you read the front page of the newspaper and it's like, yeah, John, he was, uh, he filmed the latest Batman movie on his phone, the whole thing, and uploaded it to Pirate Bay. He's now in prison for life. And he has to pay the $250,000 fine, which seems remarkably reasonable when you're in prison for life. He's gonna be making a lot of number plates. In fact, many establishments were quick to put up no Google Glass signs to enforce a complete ban on the futuristic specs of tomorrow. Ultimately, Google had created a product which made others feel deeply uncomfortable around you, and it's not quite clear what they were even trying to achieve. Even the original engineers couldn't decide whether Google Glass was meant to be worn all the time, or you were supposed to just whip out the specs for a specific task. It might have proved faintly useful for peeping toms. <laughs> great. Stalkers and people with no hands who are keen to find out more detailed information on the packet of Honey Nut Cheerios that they're eyeing up on the supermarket aisle. It's very niche use though, isn't it, Danny? But on the whole, if you want to access internet or take pictures, it's generally far less creepy to just use your phone and save yourself $1,500. Tim Badgerin, the president of Creative Studios Inc., summed up the mood of his fellow glassholes when he said, It was the worst $1,500 I've ever spent in my life. On the other hand, as a researcher, it was a great tool to help me understand what not to do when creating a product for the consumer. Well, Tim, look on the bright side of life. Whenever I buy something sh I'm like, oh man, this sucks. F Whereas really, I should be like, wow, this mop sucks. Well, at least I know how not to make a mop. Isn't that great? Although the original models have long been withdrawn from sale, Google is still bravely plugging, uh, plowing ahead with glass technology, and it's quite plausible that it could one day prove to be very useful in hos hospital and the medical industry. We will see about that. For the future, it might work out better if Google decides why exactly they're launching a new product before they design it and try to flog it. The cigarette umbrella. All right, <laughs> sounds a bit weird, but let's carry on. I'm guessing this is something from before the 1970s. Finally, here's an invention which I might actually be interested in buying if I was a smoker in 1931. I knew it. 
Trying to light and smoke a cigarette in the pissing rain is always a bit of a challenge. I live in the Cornish village of Tintagel, pronounced Tinta... Tintagel. Tintagel. Is it really? All right. And I heartily recommend a visit here in the summer. All right. Danny lives there. I don't. I live in my basement. With Danny. Ha! <laughs> Gay! Uh, but for God's sake, don't ever come in the winter, because a Cornish winter is about six months of non-stop rain and blizzards and mudslides and trees falling down and cows getting tossed around in the air. Bloody hell, that sounds real. Yeah, 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 okay, that's real. <laughs> um, yeah, like Cornwall, I believe a lot of people, like, they have homes down there, but they only go there in the summer because of the cows. But I still have to walk my dog Poppy, aww, every day under these demanding conditions. About halfway through the walk, I always stop for a cigarette to try and derive just a couple of minutes of pleasure from the whole draining ordeal. And it's always a waste of time. After just a couple of puffs at most, my torture freedom, OG Business Blade re Blaze reference there, we're not encouraging you to smoke, kids. Don't smoke. It's bad for you, but so good. Allegedly. Uh, has been heavily pelted by rain and turned into limp, soggy mush. The cigarette umbrella was designed to stop this problem. Why not just use a regular umbrella that covers your cigarette as well? Oh my, Sam. Do the honors. Put up this image here. Also, oh, okay, it's not a cigarette. That, okay, I see. So it's like a pipe with a cigarette in it that goes, this looks awesome. I'm gonna read the ad. No more rain-smoked cigarettes. Many are the inventions what does that make sense many are the inventions devised oh it's, yeah it's like old school but let me read this in an old voice many are the inventions derived to ensure a dry smoke but it has remained for a clown appearing with a circus in england to solve this problem an umbrella over the smoke keeps off water and a spigot drains off excess moisture Oh, I realize that was the terrible impression of someone from the past, but here we have it. Apparently invented by the English. Apparently invented by an English clown. This device was a metal tube that looked a bit like a pipe. It looks fucking cool. Um, you stuck your cigarette vertically into the hole near the end of the tube and lit up with complete peace of mind that it would get dry in all adverse weather conditions by the mini umbrella hanging over the tube and sheltering your precious smoke. As an extra bonus, there was even a little spigot at the bottom which drained off your spit and dribble from the intense sucking. Lovely. Uh, very little is known about the product other than it appears to have had a very, have been a very short-lived business venture. An advert for the cigarette umbrella appeared just once in a 1931 edition of Modern Mechanics magazine. After Not very modern, though, was it? I mean, modern for the day. After which the contraption seemed to disappear without trace. But all of this has made me realize that I should invest in a proper umbrella so that I can keep both myself and the cigarette dry in the future. Or I could just stop smoking. No, I'll get an umbrella. Yeah, this is a point. Like, just use a full-size umbrella. Just get one of those big golf umbrellas. Problem solved. Why are we overcomplicating things? I mean, although, look at it. Mm. Ah, beautiful. This has been Business Blaze. I do hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, smash that like button. If you didn't, smash that dislike button. But you watched to the end, so maybe you just... I mean, 7% of people statistically hate watch this channel, according to a recent poll. So there's that. Smash that dislike button, mofos. And I'll see you next time. You take a shit, you're on camera. And not just from up there. Allegedly.